the goal of the paper was really to point out to people who work in machine learning that much of what they call learning would not, to a biologist, seem like learning. If I'd come on the scene in the 1950s, there's no way I would have been suckered into working on neurons because that was clearly going to be a long haul, <laughs> right? What is something that you used to believe that you consider naive now? Oh, that's easy enough. I mean, what I did my PhD thesis on, which was... This is Brain Inspired. Hello, highly evolved brains. This is Paul Middlebrooks. All right, the only real thing I have to mention today before I introduce the guest is that I would love to hear from you. Uh, of course, I always love to hear from you, but specifically, I'd love to hear your answers to the following question. If you could wave a magic wand and manifest proficiency in some skill or body of knowledge that you feel like would help you uh, move forward in your research or work, what would that skill or body of knowledge be? Send me an email to paul at braininspired.co or reach out on Twitter. I am at pgmid, P-G-M-I-D. You will hear my guest's answer or non-answer <laughs> later in the show. That guest is Tony Zador. Tony runs his lab at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. You'll hear Tony has taken his own twisting, somewhat uh, circuitous path to his modern station, as we all do, I suppose. And the main thrusts of his research these days is twofold. One, he studies the neuroscience of auditory decision-making in rodents, and we talk about why he's chosen rodents to study what traditionally, for whatever reason, has been thought of as a higher cognitive process, decision-making. Um, and two, he studies how we might go about mapping out the connectome, that is, the blueprints for how all of our neurons connect up, to solve some otherwise unsolvable problems. Uh, and he's doing this by working on developing little unique DNA barcodes that we could insert into every neuron to figure out exactly where that neuron projects and which other neurons it connects to. I'll leave it to you for now to learn more about his work through his website linked in the show notes, because we don't really talk about any of those things today. Uh, today, we focus on his recent manuscript, suggesting the AI world might want to pay more attention to the role DNA plays in providing a massively pre-trained network, essentially, to jumpstart our development as animals. An explanation for why we don't need a million examples of a nipple, for instance, to latch on to one right after we pop out of the womb into this beautiful mess we call life. I know many human mothers may disagree with our uh, human innate ability to latch on to nipples because many do struggle, so it's not a perfect analogy. Speaking of nipples, uh, we talk a few minutes about the early days of the now coveted uh, Neural Information Processing, or NIPS, conference, uh, now called NeurIPS, because of the existence of nipples and the existence of childish men, um, and how Tony grew the well-respected COSINE conference out of that world. We also talk some evolution uh, real neurons versus artificial network units, reductionism. I even say Big Bang once. So it was a fun conversation for me. I think it'll be fun for you. You can find the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 34. So many new Patreon supporters to thank. You can find out how to do that uh, at braininspired.co. Justin, Casper, Jules, Lauren, Josh, and Michael. Holy crap. Y'all come to Durango and we'll all go rafting together. The river's high this year and the rapids are good. So come on, let's go. And thank you. Okay, please enjoy Tony Zader. Tony, welcome to the show and thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be on. If I'm right, this is your 20th year at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where you're the program chair in neuroscience. Is that right? And if so, have you celebrated or will you celebrate? 
<laughs> uh, indeed, it is my um, just about to, to be my 20th year here at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. I did recently step down as program chair of neuroscience, but I was program chair for, for quite a while. They do have a celebration for those of us who make it to the 20th year. <laughs> um, I have been invited and um, <laughs> good. I, I, I do hope to attend. Oh, good. Good for uh, you. So I'm, I'm in the rarefied company of my boss, Bruce Stillman, and a handful of others, including Jim Watson. Yeah. So you've been there since 1999. For those of you who are listening to this uh, podcast years and years from now, um, it is 2019 now. But Tony, your research really has run the gamut in terms of levels of inquiry, you know, from down at the level of molecules uh, to the synaptic level, to cells, to neural circuits, up to behavior. And you're also perfect for this show because you really entered your career. You originally worked on the theory side of neuroscience and did work with neural networks. And um, we'll talk about your early participation at the NIPS conferences or the NeurIPS conferences now uh, and how you started Cosign out of your involvement in those early uh, NIPS days. Uh, and, and through your career, you've incorporated more uh, of the experimental side, working with sliced neurophysiology, studying decision making in primates, uh, eventually pioneering the study of decision making in rodents, uh, and in your case, auditory uh, decision making. And I think, um, and we can talk more about this, I think some of those obstacles that you faced in your in that work with the rodents has led you to your connectomics uh, work, developing a DNA barcoding method to figure out the wiring diagram of mouse brains. And so I know that's an embarrassingly incomplete uh, list. No, no, there. I was going to say that's a fantastic summary of my career. And I think we can just uh, call this... Uh... This, this entire conversation to an end because I don't know what's left for me to say. <laughs> well, I was trying to fill in yeah. a couple of the details. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I was going to ask you how, how you would characterize your journey thus far, but if that's good enough, we can just proceed. That's great. I, I think the overarching theme is that I have a short attention span. Well, yeah. Well, so sometimes I ask this question toward the end of a show, but in this case, I'd like to ask you now, because you've had sort of a definitive path and everyone has a unique path, you know, if you were going to go back uh, in the early days of graduate school now, let's say, let's say you were starting off graduate school or, or somewhere around there, what pathway would you lay out for yourself or, or what would you start off in? That's an interesting question. I, I'm pretty happy with the path that I took, even though I did a lot of wandering. Uh, I mean, go, going back even further, I, I started off in physics then wandered over to linguistics oh. and went to medical school and then started in theoretical neuroscience. And all of those things in, in different ways contributed to what I ended up doing. And at, at each stage, I guess I was driven by this, this tension between these fundamental questions that I was excited about answering which are the, the big questions that many of us go into neuroscience to answer. What is consciousness? How does our mind work? Things like that. And my attraction to simple, rigorous answers. And, and the problem is there's a real tension there that the bigger the question, mm -hmm. often the less satisfying the answer. And so, you know, it's been a, a back and forth. I, I loved physics for the, the beauty of a simple equation that explains everything that you ask. I loved calculating how fast that ball goes down the inclined plane. <laughs> um, but then I, in the end, I didn't care how fast the ball goes down an inclined plane. And on the flip side, I, you know, would spend my, my evenings uh, wondering, well, what is consciousness? <laughs> and I don't think we're that much closer to understanding that than we were when I started thinking about that. So, so it's that tension between interesting questions and satisfying answers. Yeah. I wonder if a better question is just how to approach the areas of study, you know, when you go into it, because it kind of takes a, uh, a a craftsman's mindset, if you will, because you have to be, okay, so there are two ways to approach things, right? One is you follow your passions and then see where that leads you. And another is, you know, you have an interesting question. You might not necessarily be passionate about linguistics, like let's say, and maybe you were, but but you still approach it with a the mindset of, okay, I'm going to figure this out 
and then you can kind of learn and become passionate along the way. Uh, would, is that a useful distinction at all for approaching? It, it, it fascinates me the the differences in how different the, the many different paths there are to success to, to successfully addressing uh, scientific problems. What drives different people turns out, as far as I can tell, to be very different. Hmm. In my case, I'm not very good at doing things that I'm not that I'm not passionate about. I didn't always turn in my homework on time. Um, so I, if, I, if, I didn't, if I don't understand why I'm doing something, I just can't do it. If I don't understand why I'm memorizing something, I can't do it. So in my case, I don't really have a choice. Huh. I, I get super excited by a question and I, I dive into it. And then uh, when, when I get, if I get disillusioned by it, then I, I end up uh, moving on. Huh. But other people are much more disciplined. And they they say here I I see that that mountain top that I'd like to be on. I understand that to get there I will need to do a bunch of things that I'm not that excited about doing, but I will do them. And uh, many of those people end up getting to the tops of some very hard to climb mountains. Yeah, that's true. That's a good analogy. Well, let's talk about history for a minute. So I've had a, a few people on the show who have sort of lived through the early days of AI and seen the transition from symbolic AI to statistical-based neural net uh, type AI. So Terry Sinovsky was on the show, and he documented his experiences in his book, The Deep Learning Revolution. I've, I've had uh, Jay McClellan uh, on the show, and he, he shared some stories about the general you know, antagonism of the symbolic AI pioneers toward the, the statistical parallel distributed processing and, and neural network folks. Uh, and you are well traversed as well. So you were in attendance um, and and um, participated in the early uh, NIPS conferences, neural information processing conferences, which started in 87. I, I think you maybe your first abstract was in 90, 91. Yeah. So actually, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a, a slightly younger academic generation than, than, than they are. I was going to so mention they, that. You didn't have to chime in with that. I would have mentioned yeah. it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So so um, they were already established around the time that I started graduate school in nine, nine, uh, 86. So the very first conference that I ever went to as a graduate student was actually the precursor to what is now NeurIPS, which is the Snowbird Conference on uh, Neural Networks. Hmm. Uh, held at Snowbird. I think right. I, the one that I went to. So that that started in the early to mid '80s from a bunch of neural network people at Bell Labs, including John Hopfield, uh, and Terry was was among those people. And that was a small invitation only meeting. And I was lucky that that uh, my PI was invited, and I I came along for the mm -hmm. conference and and the skiing, um, and then. Um, I started going to the NIPS meetings. That became my sort of go-to conference, even more than uh, SFN, more than the Society for Neuroscience meeting, just because back then there were very few people doing um, what I was doing, which is work at the interface between computational neuroscience and neural networks. And in fact, those two fields hadn't even fully diverged at that time. And so there was there was that was I think the well to my mind it was the best place to see computational neuroscience. Um, it was the it was the NIPS conference, and that lasted for a few years, right? Where there were computational neuroscience and neural network work were really in a discourse. But so, yeah. So, can you give the flavor of like what it was like then, and and maybe how it's changed since then? And yeah. So, to my mind, back then, the question I was interested in then, and to some extent, it's the the question that has been sort of what has driven a lot of my my work is what have the conventional neural network models failed to capture about how the brain works? And so that question really has two flavors. Can you use neural network-like models to model the brain? And can you look at the brain and use them to build better neural network-type models that compute more effectively? Hmm. And now it's easy to articulate those as two separate questions, <laughs> but at the time, I, I certainly didn't have quite as much clarity that those were two questions. So, in, and I think a lot of the people in the field sort of considered them to be similar questions, and the, mm -hmm. many of the same people worked, including Terry. Uh, 
I mean, Terry's lab uh, is, is, I mean, his, his is one of the preeminent computational neuroscience labs, and he is one of the people who contributed in a lot of ways to basic neural network theory. So, right. you know, th those back then, those were, were not fully differentiated. And it was only later that the NIPS community started sort of pushing the argument that, look, yes, birds you know, they, they start, everybody would, would trot out the birds analogy, right? Oh, we're going to talk Bir about that later too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just, just, you know, for, for your listeners, you know, yeah. birds fly, but we don't necessarily look to birds to build better airplanes. Uh, and that became the sort of prevailing wisdom at NIPS. And, and at that point, sort of the neuroscience community, the computational neuroscience community at NIPS sort of shrank and, and shriveled up for the most part. Well, let's just interject because I want to talk about this birds thing real quick, because I swear to you, this happened to me before I even read this, the paper that we're going to talk about today, because uh, I've had multiple guests on the show use the birds analogy, and I've <laughs> kind of nodded my head, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy. You're right. And then I was on a run the other day, and I was, <laughs> I was thinking, it's a really a poor analogy, because sure, if you want to talk about how airplanes, quote unquote, fly, we build wings and use propellers. And and it can fly. Nowadays, we even use jets sometimes. Or or turbine and yeah, engines, jets, <laughs> you know. But if you compare that to the diversity of how flies, insects, and other birds fly, it's it's not even a comparison. Right. But anyway, I, mean, I, thought, a... I thought of this, and then I read your paper, and in the last paragraph of your paper, you say that you articulate these uh, same ideas, and I thought, oh, that guy. He must be a genius because he thinks like me. That's what I thought. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the bird's analogy is flawed. And actually, I think another one of your uh, guests, um, Botfinick, provided some history I didn't know that apparently some of the early uh, uh, aeronautics engineers actually did take specific inspiration from birds beyond the fact that they provide an existence proof for flight. Right. Yeah. So, I anyway. don't really know the history of aviation well enough to comment on that, but yeah, yeah. I'm gratified to hear that the the bird's analogy is flawed in other ways as well. <laughs> That's right. And many of those early people who took inspiration probably did die, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's for another. That's for the you history. Mean while books. flying, yeah, well, think... while attempting to fly, while yes. attempting to fly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, sorry for the diversion, but 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 so then through the bird analogy, the the NIPS people shooed away all the computational neuroscientists, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. I, I don't think it was an explicit decision, right. but the the community there began to shrink to the point where it was not. I mean, there there was. I think there was always a neuroscience track at NIPS. But it began, I, and I, and honestly, there might have been people who continued to go there for that, but I found it less appealing, and so did most of the people I knew. You found it so uh, unappealing that you started your own conference, the Neural Information Encoding, or NICS conference. And that's that, right. That was an invitee-only affair as well, correct? That's right. That's right. So inspired, actually, by the Snowbird conferences... I started a series of, um, when I was still a postdoc, I started a series of invitation-only conferences on computational neuroscience, but that sort of differed from some of the other computational neuroscience meetings in that we really tried to always invite a mix of theorists and experimentalists. Mm. And those went on for, I guess the first one was 96 at Jackson Hole, um, and then we started to have a series of them at Snowbird and a, a few other. They, coincidentally, they were all ski resorts in the West, but they were typically held in February. But that was just pure coincidence. Uh, but they were, I think, they were very, really influential meetings for me and and um, sort of a, a group of people who went back year after year. And they they continued until I, I stopped being the primary organizer at some point. And I, several other people organized it. Um, and they, they continued till I think around 2002. Hmm. And then at that point, we, we decided that, um, the sort of demand in the community for these meetings exceeded what you could do with a small invitation only meeting. Uh. And then we rebooted as what is now the cosine meeting, which is not invitation only. It's open to everyone and it has abstract and it's modeled directly after NIPS. And it's growing like NIPS, I think, right? It's growing like NIPS was growing before the um, before the AI explosion. 
the modern um, machine learning explosion. So right. uh, we are now, we started off at around, I guess, 300. And this year we topped, I think, 1,100. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our goal was not to grow, but we are growing. And so we're figuring out uh, how to handle that exactly. I mean, I guess that's a good problem to have in some respects. Yeah, it changes the, the flavor of a meeting, but that, right. that's a whole other discussion. It reflects the fact that there are a lot of people interested in computational and systems neuroscience. So that's what the cosine, CO as in computational, SY as in systems, and E as in neuroscience. Like you said, I know that the NIPS conferences these days, because of the AI explosion, sells out in minutes, right? Is that the... <laughs> Yeah, that's I mean, that's my understanding. Yeah. I, I literally I haven't been to NIPS literally in ten years. So, but yeah. from what I understand, yes, it's it's like harder to get tickets to that than to a very popular concert. Both of which I'd probably stay away from. But, yeah. So, okay, last question about some history and the current state of affairs. So, it's not NIPS anymore; it's NURIPS, right? Um, that's right. And even in Terry's book, he refers to it as NIPS. That's how recently the change happened, I guess. Do you have okay? So I when I heard oh they're changing the I guess acronym to NeurIPS, um, I I honestly I'm so naive I couldn't figure out why until I heard that it was because NIPS can be short for nipples, and that's the reason, right? Do Do you have a take on the necessity of changing it, or was there like some chauvinistic culture that really shadowed it, or what? Do you know? Um, I mean, I only I. I... I read a couple articles about it, the same ones that are publicly available. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's no secret that especially the the tech world is prone to juvenile jokes and is not is not always welcoming to a diverse group of of people. And so I think this was um by popular demand in order to sort of help change the culture. I have I no see. idea whether it's successful, but it's certainly it was worth trying. Yeah. Well, and so we ad advance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about evolution here. Actually, the paper we're going to talk about was sent to me via Twitter. Tim on Twitter suggested that I cover this paper and have you on the show. So thanks, Tim. Um, and actually, you, Tim. <laughs> something, something actually useful came from Twitter. Imagine <laughs> that. Okay. So a critique of pure learning what artificial neural networks can learn from animal brains. Uh, is this, is it bioarchive? I, yeah, I put it on bioarchive. Bioarchive. For now. So let For me now, see if... it's, under, it's under review, so hopefully it'll oh, be good. in a referee journal at some point. Okay, great. So let me see if I, if I have the take-home right, and then you can correct me. So over evolution, DNA provides a massive amount of inherent learning that manifests as the wiring principles of our brains, and, and thus sets up a massively pre-trained system, essentially, that, that we uh, can then learn on top of during our lifetimes. Whereas any current deep learning or AI system, supervised or unsupervised, suffers from having to learn everything from scratch. So in broad strokes, is that accurate? And what am I missing there? In broad strokes, that's right. Part of the the goal of the paper was really to point out to people who work in machine learning that much of what they call learning would not, to a biologist, seem like learning. A lot of it came from miscommunications that seemed to arise because people in different fields use words in different ways. And it was my attempt to lay out cleanly what I think most biologists would agree is happening, most neuroscientists would agree is happening in real organisms, namely that most organisms come with a great deal of innate capacity to perform well in the environment, and how much that's in contrast with how machine learning people see what the, the, the problem is. Hmm. Um, the the intellectual problem, which so they they usually the problem formulation at least traditionally starts with a tabula rasa network, right? And from an evolutionary point of view, it would be <laughs> it would be insane to not build in structure if it were possible to do so, right? Right? If you have two organisms, one of which comes 
out of the box, born with the capacity to navigate the environment effectively, and the other has to learn everything from scratch each time. If it were possible to build in stuff innately, that organism would be selected for. And in fact, I would argue that that is what happens. So that's really the, the core idea behind the paper is trying to sort of clarify for both communities how they how they formulate the problem and to recognize that a lot of what is called learning in the machine learning community would not be considered learning in the neuroscience community. That, this is an ongoing issue, I think. I mean, even calling artificial units neurons is is problematic just in a conversational way. It's difficult. But... Indeed, indeed. Yeah. In fact, my yeah, my thesis, my PhD thesis was on trying to understand the ways in which uh, actual biological neurons differ from the summation units of neural networks. So I did my 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 thesis was on dendritic processing. Yeah. In in real neurons. Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, there's a lot to sort out moving forward in both fields I, or, or the crosstalk between the fields. Yeah. But, and okay. So Tony, I mean this in the best way possible. You're a rodent guy. Um, so m meaning that you've, you've studied auditory decision-making in, in rodents and uh, sensory um, processes. And in the paper, you argue that um, if, if we figure out mouse level AI, that essentially will be right super close to human level AI. Uh, do you want to, how is that? Do you want to just ex expound on that idea for a moment? Why do I believe that? Yeah. You're asking why I believe that. Why do I believe that if we could just get to mouse level AI, we'd be a, a short step away from human level AI? Is it for grant funding is my question. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, it, <laughs> there's plenty of stuff that I, <laughs> I do for, for uh, grant funding, but this actually is a, a fundamental belief that is why I study decision making in rodents and, for example, not in spiders, but on the other hand, not in people or monkeys. Right. Um, it's why I chose rodents. And so basically my argument is uh, an, an evolutionary argument that it, you know, animals have been on this planet for of order 500 million years or so, depending on exactly what, where you draw the line for animals, five, six, 700 million years. Vertebrates have been around for 400, 500. Mammals have been around for about 100 million years, and they represent, you know, over that time, there have been something like Avogadro's number of individual animals <laughs> that, that evolution has operated on. 99.9% um, .9 of which are gone. 99.9% .9 of which are gone. But if, if you formulate the problem right, even the ones that didn't make it have to be considered when you, when you think about how the ones that did survive, what they have extracted, like how much of the space has been sampled yeah. of the space of all possible networks. So right. really, we, there's been a tremendous amount of evolution to get to um, vertebrates uh, and uh, to get to mammals. And the reason I'm focusing on mammals is that mammals all share what I consider to be the fundamental uh, advance that enabled human intelligence, intelligence, which is the neocortex. So we've had the neocortex for about 100 million years. And, you know, our, our cortex, as far as we can tell, the basic principles are not very different between a mouse, um, a, a primate, and, and, and in particular, a human, it took, you know, the, the, the difference between our primate ancestors and a modern rodent, you know, probably we have to go back more than 10, 20 million years to see really big differences. Hmm. And so, you know, the things that really make humans special in terms of their apparent intellectual prowess those things came in the last few million years. And, you know, I started off in linguistics, so I'm particularly impressed by our ability to, to do language. And that, you know, depending on whether you think Neanderthal had language or not, probably emerged in the last couple hundred thousand or, or million years. We know that, that our closest primate uh, relatives currently can't master language. So 
whatever that evolutionary jump was really very recent. Mm. And, you know, the primate population sizes were pretty small. So we're talking not very much evolution to get us from a neocortex to a creature capable of human type intellectual uh, functioning. And so that's why I believe that the hard step is to get to the general purpose cortical operation that rodents are capable of i say rodents i mean we could could easily have done cats or dogs it's just that 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 rodents are the common uh, lab species tractable lab species for studying these things well you saying that i can't wait if it is that recent of a step and that small of a step to get from our symbolic like processing or to our symbolic like processing i can't wait to see what's what's next for us evolutionarily, right? Like what our cortices are capable of. Yeah, although it's not clear where these, you know, any particular strategy asymptotes, right? Right. right. So there's this, you know, the, the, those who believe in the singularity think that aha, as soon as we get to to human level intelligence, we'll quickly surpass it. Right. But it's also possible that this kind of strategy tops out after. A lo- something a little bit higher than human intelligence. You need a fundamentally different strategy that um, we can't get to using these types of approaches. Proof that um, we're at the tip of the evolutionary arrow, right? We're the cream of the crop. So, yeah. <laughs> supervised learning, the main type used in deep learning these days that's kind of associated with what the, the AI explosion uh, is not enough to explain how we learn from early childhood. So for example, Kids don't need a million examples to learn what a car is, for instance, right? Exactly. And one suggestion, as you note in the paper, um, has been maybe that kids are built in with this uh, powerful unsupervised learning uh, system really early on, and that can can then give way to a supervised learning type system later on. You suggest that an early unsupervised learning system in the early in the developmental process is not enough to explain the the behavioral skills of young animals and humans. Uh, and you give a lot of examples uh, about how how many of our learning skills are innate, right? So there's a possibility that the maxim uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence uh, could be in play in this case. Uh, or, or do you think that it's just too wide of a chasm to imagine an unsupervised learning algorithm that is powerful enough that could get kids on the right track, you know, animal kids and children kids on the right track early enough? Well, so in some sense, it, if if you divide learning into supervised and unsupervised, and we agree that the learning is that is required for a child to learn language is not supervised, then that only leaves unsupervised. So in some sense, it must be the case that unsupervised learning is responsible for learning things like language or categories. The the question isn't whether it's uh, unsupervised learning. The question is whether, to my mind, is whether it's a general purpose unsupervised algorithm that could learn anything in a comparable amount of time. And my belief is that it's not a general purpose unsupervised um, algorithm. It's some unsupervised learning on top of a great deal of innate structure that we are born with because of evolutionary selection. So the hardest place for us to see that at work, I think, is in, in humans, in children. Right. That that it's easy to see why one might believe that huh. humans require or, or rely on um, a tabula rasa unsupervised learning approach because humans are so helpless at birth <laughs> and then they take years to get up to speed. Right. But we are I don't believe because because I'm a, a neuroscientist and a, a biologist who believes that we are just an incremental step away from the creatures out of which we uh, from which we evolved I think the idea is to my, my approach anyway is to to go back and look at these um, earlier creatures and say well does that also could that really explain what's going on with these other creatures hmm. like rodents or spiders so if we go back to insects right S- insects are born basically ready to go right 
And our fish are born with a great deal of innate structure ready to go. That's not to say they, you know, they, they function absolutely perfectly. At, no, there's a little fine tuning that needs to go on. But for the most part, they're not spending three years getting up to speed with their environment before they're ready to reproduce. They've got, you know, hours, days, or usually at most weeks before they're uh, let loose in the environment. And so to my mind, that is the argument that there has to be a great deal of innate structure. There, there, there's other arguments, too. There are some cases where creatures do things for which they have zero examples, not one example, but zero examples. Right. So there are a great number of innate behaviors that are really innate, is this at like, least portions I, of them. Do I have this right? From Did you use a squirrel jumping from branch to branch in the paper? Uh, no, squirrel, squirrel jumping, you know... I, I, I haven't studied squirrel jumping, but I imagine that they take small jumps and then larger jumps. And you sort of see. No, but for example, burrowing behavior. Burrowing, yeah, there you go. So, so burrowing behavior, there are. there's this fantastic work by Hopi Hoekstra at Harvard who studies different species of a rodent called Paramiscus that depending on the exact species, they build very different nests, very different burrows. And some are long and complicated and have a bunch of side pockets and some are shorter and they, they all have characteristic shapes and these are built in to the hardware mm -hmm. right these are innate in the sense that if you take a pup from one strain that builds a complicated burrow and let it be reared by a mom from the other one that pup will grow up and build a complex uh, not a simple burrow in other words it builds the one that its genetics endowed it with not the one that its mom mm -hmm. would build and so how do you encode stuff like that in a genome well you can imagine how you might do that but that's just uh, you know that that's just an, a, a potentially experimentally tractable example of a huge number of innate behaviors and so to my mind if you believe that there are things that can be inscribed into your behavior by genetics then I think there's a strong argument to be made that evolution would select for as many of those as are useful. And, you know, if, if you can build into my nervous system a way of learning languages more quickly than my competitors or more effectively than my competitors, I, I will outperform. There will be selection pressure for my offspring to thrive. And so really the question to my mind, isn't whether it's possible to put these things into the genome, but rather, how, why is it that in humans, some of them, some of that, that innate stuff was left out, or so much of that innate stuff was left out? Mm. And I think that the answer, of course, is that um, there's a trade-off. The more innate uh, behavior you have, the uh, less flexibility you have to deal with new environmental situations, new environments. And so we as humans have sort of are probably as far away from um, maxing out on what's innate as any creature in the animal kingdom. But that said, we're still mostly innate. That's an, that's an interesting dynamic and, you know, of losing the innateness to grant other abilities. But we'll hold off on that for now. So, so you, in, you distinguish between supervised learning uh, in the paper the, uh, for artificial neural networks and what you call supervised evolution. I mean, this is along the same lines of what you were just talking about. So what do you mean by the, the term supervised evolution? Yeah, so that, that was just an attempt to be a little bit provocative. <laughs> yeah, to, worked. To, 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 <laughs> to, to say that, to think about what goes on in a supervised learning network as supervised learning uh, is no more accurate than it would be to call it supervised evolution. Super, this supervised um, process is a really useful way for us as people building technology to get the network to do what we want, to find the network structure, the network weights that achieve some objective function. And that's fantastic. It's way more efficient than um, what I would say is, is likely to be the dominant way that evolution uh, comes mm. across it, which is basically a random walk, mm. right? So evolution has the advantage of being able to operate on, you know, Avogadro's number of organisms over um, many, many 
uh, years. Like a, like a genetic algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Like for the most part, you know, people can quibble, but in most cases, genetic algorithms are not as efficient as, you know, gradient descent. But apparently evolution, you know, for a variety of reasons, evolution didn't use supervised learning, right? The problem formulation is not well adapted to the real um, uh, challenges we, we, you know, to, to, to the problems that biological organisms face. So it's fine that we use supervised learning. It's fantastic that people have figured out how to accelerate the process of finding the right weights in a network to solve a problem. That's fantastic, right? But that doesn't correspond, in my opinion, to learning. It's just a, a trick for finding interesting network structures that solve problems. And so we, we could apply that same approach to, quote unquote, evolution, and we could you know, evolution in the lab, and we could call that supervised evolution. And, you know, had the history of the field been different, had had it been evolutionary biologists who figured out how to do mach- what we now call machine learning, we might very well call it um, supervised evolution. I can't wait for the first supervised evolution lab. Exactly. By a future PI. So, you know, could or should DNA through evolution then be considered a mechanism of information compression exactly you know or like a bottleneck of information to accommodate such vast yeah so so the way i see it data. What, what's going on is biological organisms have to compress everything they know and where i use no in quotes about the structure of the network that they're going to build into the genome. They have to pass network structure through uh, what I would call a genomic bottleneck, and um, that that that's just a, a, a fact. You know, what, everything you know it, be, because every organism arises from uh, a single cell with one genome. Everything about that organism's network structure has to come out of that genome, and so that genome encodes a series of rules for construct wiring up a network and you know those rules which could by the way be use dependent some of those rules can be use dependent are the rules mm-hmm. that provide us with the, the the brains that we we then walk around with so i think that that passing the network structure through a genomic bottleneck actually acts as what in machine learning might be called a regularizer it requires sort of boiling down huh. the most useful network motifs into a relatively short description length. And then that sort of rigor, that constraint actually requires that really it's the most interesting network motifs that get passed along. And I think really it was, you know, it, it took it took a long time, but eventually the one of the most fruitful network motif was um, the cortex. So the neocortex is, I think, you know, the the brilliant result of many, many hundreds of millions of years of uh, evolution. That's interesting. I had uh, Federico Turkheimer on the show this past episode, which hadn't aired yet since I've talked to you. But uh, one of the points that he makes in his work is how the brain, uh, both functionally and uh, anatomically, is fractal in nature, right? It looks the, the same on multiple scales. And it, it just struck me that thinking about DNA as a, a bottleneck of information, uh, I cannot remember the name, but there has been recent, fairly recent work on uh, the on deep layered networks, like the kind that are used to mimic layers in the brain, right, of visual processing, and how these can be thought of mathematically as information bottlenecks from one layer mm. to the other to the mm. next in, in compressing the information. And it is, I wish... It escapes me uh, who that work was done by. I'll, I'll look it up after the show. Uh, anyway, just an interesting side note that could the DNA un- uh, algorithm toward cortex and all the layers in between be fractal in nature? Whether but it's fractal, yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> there's, there's the information bottleneck idea, right, which, which goes back to uh, Tali Tishby and Bill Bialik, uh, I think, in a series of papers mm probably starting around the late 90s, um, and the idea that by compressing information down, it's sort of a generalization of the idea of the autoencoder, that by impress- compressing information down, 
if you if you send it through a compressed layer, what comes out the other side if you if you play your cards right is only what's useful. Yeah, it's forcing what's useful. Yeah, interesting. exactly. A principle yeah. of the universe, perhaps. So yes, no, I think it's a, I think that that's exactly the principle that evolution exploits. As an interesting side point, you know, you might think, well, given that you have to pack everything you know you're going to have about the brain network into a genome, <laughs> you might want to pack more. And the way to do that would be to expand your genome. Yeah. And it turns out there are organisms that have uh, genomes that are 100 times larger than, than the human genome. And so there's no biological constraint that says we're limited by the actual size of our genome. And so interestingly, the fact I would say that the fact that our genome isn't 100 times larger than it is, is an argument that it's advantageous to compress down the wiring diagram into even a tiny fraction of our existing genome. Because if it were useful to use a bigger genome, that would apparently not be a fundamental problem to uh, for biology to solve. For biology. But, but let's say that we're somehow able to decode the pre-trained information in co- that is in the DNA uh, in a way that gives, you know, like deep learning the same sort of start that an animal has upon birth, right? In, in some sort of network. I mean, could we actually be limiting ourselves and thus our AI systems by the constraints that are compressed, encoded into biological DNA and into the innate learning? Does that make sense? Well, I guess the way I would say it is this. If, if we consider the set of all possible networks, right, that's, that's a pretty big space to, yes. to wander through. So it, it, in modern deep, you know, in the modern era of deep networks, we have already sort of constrained ourselves to a subset of all those, right? So even if you take a deep network that has millions of parameters, they're not organized uh, willy-nilly. They're organized in a particular structured way, right? I mean, hence the term deep networks, sure. layer after layer and the layers have characteristic properties. So we're already imposing some structure. and you know, there's, I think, a lot of theoretical work going on right now trying to understand why that particular structure is a useful one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people have some ideas, and I think they don't fully understand why. But it, it turns out that somehow those kinds of networks are well suited to learn the kinds of things that you might want a network to learn. And they're particularly trainable in small numbers of, or relatively small, in smaller numbers of samples than networks of other structure. Right. So it's quite possible that there exists, um, at least it seems, so, so far in the absence of theoretical results to the contrary, it seems possible that there exists somewhere in the space of all possible networks, uh, ones that are even better. But I would argue that rather than looking through the space of all possible networks, why don't we sort of take our inspiration from the networks that we already know can solve the problems of interest. Spoken like a true neuroscientist. <laughs> <laughs> well, so as you note uh, in the paper, transfer learning or the ability for a neural network to uh, be trained on one task and then transfer its its learned skills, let's say, to a new task, that's an active area of work in artificial intelligence these days. But this is very different from the way that DNA gets transferred from one generation to the next through time. So can you just comment on that and, and talk about how... Yeah, I think the big difference there is that in transfer learning, at least as I know the field, the amount of information that one might use to transfer to the new network is not constrained. So you can use um, as much information. You could Basically, the, the sort of naive way to do transfer learning is you just take the weights that you trained it up, strip off the last few layers, and then you initialize the network to the weights of the first N layers mm-hmm. of the network. And that's a lot of information. And so that that for, I, I suspect that that will work for a smaller class of problems than the more general solution, which is, again, to boil down the key aspects of that wiring diagram through something that is... Um, a bottleneck, the the genome. So I would say that sort of conceptually, they they share some insight that you you might not want to relearn everything from scratch every generation, 
But I think biology actually has turned what at first blush might seem to be a constraint into a feature, which is that it has to abstract the key aspects of that wiring diagram and 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 fit it into you know a small bit of a genome Hmm. and in fact it has to do so you know what comes out of the genome of course at least in in creatures in most creatures is not a detailed wiring diagram of the form you know wire neuron one to neuron three seven nine and two billion but rather a set of rules and so by forcing it through a genomic bottleneck it it sort of asks us to, uh, to to look at what kinds of wiring rules would be effective for that um, that wiring. Right, like like the the nematode, as you point out, has uh, it, its connections are actually completely instructed by the DNA, whereas uh, maybe humans and mammals, this could be the the DNA uh, evolution's test on you know let's take it from a complete wiring diagram to just some rules and some algorithms exactly. suggestions and. So I guess we're seeing how that test is coming along. Yeah. So here I am again, Tony. I've I've asked this question multiple times in the past to many guests here, but I've asked it with uh, neuronal properties in mind and anatomy in mind and biophysical properties in mind. And now I'm going to ask it with the DNA in mind. How biophysically accurate, how biologically accurate in the details are we going to eventually need to be to build uh, an AI that will, you know, that, to make an AI that will work on the level of, in your case, let's say a mouse. I, so my day job is being a <laughs> neuroscientist. So, um, as, you know, as part of my day job, I care deeply about all those details. Right. I, I, you know, as a, as I mentioned, as a graduate student, I did, mo- I made models of processing and single neurons, dendritic processing, as um, a postdoc, I looked at the nuances of synaptic transmission, and and now as a PI, I study neural circuits. So I care about those details intimately, but I don't believe that there's only one solution. Hmm. So I don't believe that the solution that will allow us to build an intelligent machine will necessarily involve single units that have dendrites and particular complements of calcium and sodium channels arrayed in just the right way. The reason I study the details is so that eventually I can get to the underlying principles, abstract them away, and then say, ah, what's important about all those details is X, Y, and Z. Right. And so my belief is that almost none of the biophysical details will be important. The problem is that without at least, the only way I know how to figure out which details are important is to understand in actual neuroscience settings, how those details work together to uh, enable behavior. So once we understand what's going on in a biological system, then we can abstract that stuff away and say, no, 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 no. What's important is not the calcium channels, et cetera. What's important is X, Y, or Z. So, you know, over the course of thinking about this, I've had different opinions about what really is important. Right. And, you know, as a graduate student, I thought what was most important was that the simple processing units that um, are used in, in artificial neural networks are too simple. And by the end of my graduate work, although I had a lot of fun uh, learning how individual neurons worked, I concluded that, eh, okay, really, it's not a qualitative difference. Sure, um, an individual neuron does something more complicated than a processing unit, but by that, you could really just replace one um, individual unit with, uh, or one individual neuron with maybe a dozen units, and you're done. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there's, there's no deep thing missing. It's just maybe uh, it'll take 10 times as many simple units as neurons. Okay. What I ended up concluding was that what is fundamentally different is that actual neural networks in the brain, real real networks of real neurons have highly structured connectivity. You know, it's, it's sparse and 
they're, the neurons are wired up in very specific ways and that really it's just what endows a, a brain with its capacity is the wiring diagram. Mm. And so that is how I got to from studying pure decision making to trying to understand at the level of the actual wiring diagram how those decisions are made at the level of which neurons are connected to which other neurons to produce this neural activity. So, I, man, there's so many different ways we can go from here because you're doing some really great work with uh, connectomics and, and just what we're talking about. Maybe before we get there, and I, I can't take I can't take all of your time for the day, but just thinking about levels, these levels of understanding and what it takes. Uh, I had John Krakauer uh, on the show maybe a month or two ago, and I don't remember if we talked about it on the show or I had the opportunity to have beers with him beforehand. And I don't know. I don't remember if it was over beers or on the show, uh, but he made the point. It's sort of his outlook is that when, you know, you can use brain circuitry and brain activity, neuronal activity, even uh, sort of as a check on the validity of, of how, of our understanding of higher cognitive functions and like our hypotheses for how these higher cognitive functions work, let's say. Uh, but but you don't need to really understand these lower level phenomena. You don't really need to understand the circuitry, the the wiring diagram, the uh, you know the the circ the um, uh, the spike rates of all the neurons, for instance, you know, to understand the higher cognitive functions themselves. So, do you think that understanding the the constraints imposed by DNA, the why, and then you know the connectomic, uh, the connectome, the wiring diagram, will improve our understanding of the the mental or psychological, higher cognitive, I'm doing air quotes right now, uh, functions that, that we call our cognition? Yeah, so so obviously I wouldn't be doing what I do <laughs> if I well, didn't no. believe that. But you could that, be doing I'm, it because it's interesting in its own right, you know? You're right, I could be. So it turns, you're, you're right, it's not obvious. In my case, I, I think if, if, you know, we went back to the starts of our careers we would probably find that we were interested in understanding the same fundamental questions. You know, how do humans think? Yes. I just concluded that the way to get there was to understand the circuits at a really low level because those are tractable. It's again, the trade-off between really interesting questions and what to my mind are satisfying answers. Mm -hmm. So I have, there, there was just no question that you could get satisfying answers to questions about how one neuron drives another neuron to fire. How do synapses work? And potentially, right, I can tell you what the form of the answer is for what a wiring diagram looks like, right? That's well, de well defined. And I can tell you whether or not I got, in principle, whether or not we got the right answer, right? right? It's, it's hard. I might not get there, um, but at least it's really well defined. And so I would say that the, the argument that we can just sort of look at the top level of cognition, I push back on that because there is a name for the field where people look at that sort of top level. And traditionally, that is psychology, right? right? The very top level where you um, look at human behavior or you look even at animal behavior uh, without trying to pry open the black box, that's psychology. And that is, you, you, I believe you can only get so far without opening up the, the black box. I, I don't think that people today are that much smarter than they were <laughs> 50 or 100 years ago. Yeah. I don't think we're that much better at designing experiments so that we can expect without sort of something new to make progress on that. And this actually, so he wrote a, um, a very provocative and controversial piece, I think it was in neuron john crocker did uh a, a couple years ago maybe two three Th years is, ago this is what we talked about when he was on the show yeah yeah and I, you know it made a lot of points and i was sympathetic to some specifically that one can't forget about behavior but the idea that one can only look at behavior or maybe use neuroscience as a check afterwards makes no sense to me that yeah that's not what they argued in the paper really so uh, i'm and i'm speaking for him and i shouldn't be obviously okay but but it, it, I think their point was just that it needs more behavior to be more inclusive of behavior. But, but yeah, we don't need sure. to. Well, as, as someone whose labs, you know, spent <laughs> uh, the first maybe five years, along with my close colleague, Zach Mainin, 
figuring out how to train rats to perform the kinds of tasks <laughs> that previously people had only trained non-human primates to uh, perform. I'm very sympathetic yes. to the idea that one has to study behavior very, very closely. Yeah. But my belief, which I think is actually at odds with at least how I read that paper, is that that's not nearly enough. And that the way that in general science and biology in particular and neuroscience even more in particular move forward is with new technologies. And so having a well-controlled behavior provides uh, an interesting object to study in the right way. But the tools with which we study it, those ha I, have to, or or it would, it would be foolhardy to ignore the fact that we've made tremendous advances in how we can study single neurons, populations of neurons, how we can manipulate them, I mean, channel redops and the whole optogenetic revolution. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to not use those tools would be um, a mistake. And I, there's there's a whole other discussion, but I'll just make an argument. I'll throw out this yeah. this argument that actually uh, the history of uh, science is really the interaction between scientific questions and technologies. So if you go back to almost every uh, major discovery that I can think of in neuroscience, where I know the history pretty well, it was enabled by a technological advance that preceded it. So Hodgkin, my favorite paper in all of Oh. Neuroscience, the Hodgkin Huxley papers, right, involved the voltage clamp. Yeah. The development of the voltage clamp, which uh, was developed by Casey Cole and taught to uh, either Hodgkin or Huxley a few years after he developed it. And that in turn required the development of um, uh, tubes that were capable of, of uh, enabling a feedback amplifier, right? So you can trace a direct line from something from electrical engineering and electronics to the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. You can do a similar thing with single channel recording, low noise um, amplifiers that were sufficiently low noise that you could resolve single channel. And you could go on yeah, and on, yeah. two photon, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. So all these advances that enabled us to study things we couldn't previously study came from technology. But that's a whole other. Yeah, it is. I'll just have to have you back on the show. So. <laughs> So, so in my experience, and you've talked a little bit about this, uh, and I fought against this and my experience in science, in academia, uh, is that people often come in with the big questions, you know, uh, uh, what is consciousness and things, but then knowledge ruins it. You know, we, we learn that we don't even understand the processes that are underlying the processes that we think are associated with the big questions. That's right. right? So the idea that you develop uh, in the paper it's not exactly reductionist. So my, my point is you people in their careers tend to end up studying sort of lower level processes and then lower level. And that tends to be the trajectory. <laughs> yeah. Of what, you know, and then, and you're interested in it too, because you yeah. think, Oh, it undergirds the higher level processes. But then, yeah. you know, 20 years later, you're studying electrons or whatever, you know, that's but, right. Yeah. So, so the idea that you espouse in the paper with the DNA it's not exactly reductionist because it, it gives DNA essentially a higher order role in intelligence, right? But one could go off the deep end here and say that, well, DNA is made of nucleotides and it's uh, under the rule of, you know, principles of entropy and, and you know, uh, metabolism and so on. And so we could look at that level and say, actually, you have to consider not just the whole of life before us, which evolution uh, encompasses, but the whole of existence as the innate intelligence that we start off with, maybe from the Big Bang, you know, is is that just too crazy of an idea? You know, why is DNA the right level to zero in on here? Well, I'm not saying that. Okay, so at one level, what you're saying is right, and you know, you, you can sit there stoned in your dorm room wondering. <laughs> is it okay um, if I light up real quick while we talk? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You can sit there stoned in your dorm room wondering about the the deep questions, and you know that can paralyze you or at least entertain you for um, as long as you like. But operationally, right, there is, in my mind, to my mind, a reason for stopping at the level of DNA, of recognizing that the genome actually conceptually plays an important role in this whole process by uh, acting as a, as, a, as a bottleneck to the hmm. transfer of information about the circuit from one generation to the next. To my mind, that's all we need to know sort of uh, 
at the abstract level to sort of move forward on this as a theoretical question. Now, as a, as a practical question, right, there are developmental neuroscientists who study the process of going from DNA to a wiring diagram, right? Right, And I happen not to be one of them. I think it's an interesting field, yet. but right yet, <laughs> but sure that, 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 that is in the actual experimental science. That's what one would study, right? One would choose to study how you go from DNA to a wiring diagram. That's developmental neuroscience, but, uh, and, and there are certainly some insights from that, that might guide one's thinking at the theoretical level for how to build a, a network through pass through some kind of a, a bottleneck. But the way I look at this is you look to the biology for inspiration and then you take your best shot, right? And that that's actually what the field of neural networks did, right? Like if you look at what happened, right, as you made the, the transition from symbolic AI to neural networks, to the first generation of neural networks, right? Symbolic AI basically involved people thinking, introspecting and, and thinking about psychology without thinking about the all those nasty details that are inside <laughs> that that black box. And I don't blame them, right? If I if I'd come on the scene in the 1950s, there's no way I would have been suckered into working on neurons because that was clearly going to be a long haul, <laughs> right? So if there was this promise that you could just, you know, you've got a computer, I've you got, I got a brain, you've got a brain, I can look at your brain. You know what? I could, I can just figure it out and just write down a program. Sure, right? Why not? That that's clearly it was an obvious thing to try, and at least, you know, I suspect that had I been around back then, I would have kept trying it and retired after not having <laughs> figured out how the the the, the brain worked. But I, by the time I got to the scene it seemed pretty clear to me that the symbolic approach wasn't going to work. And so there was this generation of one simple level of abstraction of how the brain works that was built into sort of neural networks, right? A simple processing unit that takes inputs from a bunch of other neurons and produces an output. And I got to say that that's, you know, given what people knew about how neurons worked back then, it wasn't bad pretty or good. sort of an abstract uh, an abstract abstraction. It wasn't bad for an abstraction, but it missed some stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And now, 50 years later, we're sort of talking about, well, out of all the many, many things it missed, which of those were important? Yeah. Or or were any of them important? Is, was that enough? Yeah. Right? And so my my own belief is that you can keep, you should keep going back to the neuroscience and ask, okay, given what we know today, is there anything that we can we can use to sort of guide the next generation? And there are some clear successes there, right? So convolutional neural networks were explicitly inspired by looking at uh, Hubel and Weasel type receptive fields, right? right? Jan LeCun was like inspired by that, right? And he he thought about it and then abstracted it really nicely. He didn't slavishly build center surround receptor or you know ed edge detecting receptive fields but he was inspired by that right and if you look at sort of um I, I, the work in reinforcement learning again people were inspired by the biology of reinforcement learning that's been a great example of a field the people who study reinforcement learning in neuroscience are talking to the people who are exploiting reinforcement type learning ideas to build better um, algorithms right? yeah. those people are talking to each other all the time in many cases it's some of the same people well that that's one of the examples where the biology and the artificial neural uh, ai really map onto each other well have, have that's right each other well. yeah so, yeah yeah that's been a huge success any uh any reactions that you've had uh to the manuscript that stand out that have you know uh been either really positive or have kept you up at night um well i would say that i circulated that manuscript um, around to a bunch of friends and colleagues. And so the early drafts of the manuscript elicited some really strong, <laughs> negative, mostly negative responses, <laughs> but from friends who... That's the best kind, yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic from a bunch of colleagues, mostly from the machine learning community, oh. uh, who thought I was saying things that I wasn't saying or didn't mean to say, and who also didn't necessarily share my intuitions 
And a lot of what this paper was, was laying out the basis for where my intuitions come from. I see. Examples of innate learning in animals, for example. So I would say that a lot of the feedback that I might have gotten uh, after I released the paper were sort of encountered earlier, anticipated, and then sort of caused major rewrites. So I've, I've rarely rewritten a paper as extensively as, as this one in light of, wow. of feedback, just because I was really trying to reach out to a community and it was useful to figure out why they rejected what I was saying. So I don't think I convinced anyone. But at least I think they understand now what I'm saying. Well, that's and called progress. I, 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 yeah. So at least we're, 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 we're using words more or less the same way. Or at least I'm explaining how I would like people to use words and explaining yeah. the differences between how I would say a neuroscientist uses some words and a person in machine learning uses those same words. Well, I hope, I hope the result when it comes out in a journal isn't just doesn't lead to a battle of semantics or something because the ideas in the paper are, are awesome. Uh, it's oh. just really fun to read. And of course, I'll, I'll link to it uh, in the show notes, um, the bio archive version anyway. So thanks for writing it. And, and thanks for making me think more deeply about, about our genetic code as that sort of compressed information. So I'll stop using words because I don't want to use the wrong words now. <laughs> but I, You know, words are, mean whatever people want them to mean. It's just that if you have sure. a large community of people using words one way and a different community using that same word a different way, it's just a setup for misunderstanding. Yeah. Well, so I know that you got to go pretty soon. Um, and so we didn't really get into your fascinating work on DNA barcoding. Um, I will talk about it a little bit in the introduction and point people to it. And then, you know, maybe we'll have you on again at a later time to, to talk about it because it's really cool work that you're doing. So just a few kind of general questions before you go then. I, I heard you say in a talk that uh, you had, uh, I believe it was a graduate student, who you you suggested he or she not pursue a certain path, and then they eventually just didn't listen to you and pursued it, and it turned out to work. So do you recognize, or do you recommend that uh, advisees not listen to their advisors? Um, more or less, yeah. So what? That, that's not exactly... <laughs> <laughs> for me, the ideal interaction with um, anyone in my lab or, or anyone I work with is that we have conversations until we figure out um, why we disagree about something. And so there are a couple of reasons you can disagree. One is, you know, as simple as you're using words differently. Um, of course, it's, it's even possible that one of us is just plain wrong about a fact, or maybe one of us has the logic wrong. But the most interesting disagreements come from having uh, intuitions that are different and intuitions arise from sort of this nebulous cloud of some of all the experience you've had um, you know all the papers you've read all the experiments you've done etc and your sort of guess as to how an experiment might turn out and so with um, so in particular I was talking about my work with a, a, a brilliant former student in my lab, Peter Zemensky. And we, when he joined the lab, we agreed on the overall scope of the project. And we agreed that we would have to look at one output pathway of the auditory cortex. And then the, um, since these experiments were really hard, um, we had to pick which output pathway. We had to commit to a pathway. And um, I was advocating by analogy with work in the in the non-human primate that he look at some cortical cortical pathway let's say from the auditory uh cortex to the um prefrontal prefrontal posterior parietal sure. and yeah. he kept suggesting that we look at the striatum and i didn't know anything about the striatum other than that it was a complicated place and i didn't know anything about it <laughs> and he kept saying so what do you think about the striatum oh no don't do that <laughs> And at some point, I think he recognized that I had no logical basis for rejecting it. It was just complete uh, naivete and ignorance. And so he did exactly what he should have done, which is after having considered my arguments and um, rejected them as unfounded, did exactly what he thought was best. And he came back six months later with um, fantastic results that subsequently transformed my lab's research program. That is exactly the best interaction between a, to my mind, between a uh, 
between two people who work together, right? right. He's the one doing right. the experiment. He's the one who's ultimately responsible for the success of his project. And so, you know, I am somebody who I think could provide at best, you know, at worst, a sounding board and perhaps even some insight. But in the end, he's got to take responsibility for it. So he does what he <laughs> thinks is best. And this is a conversation I have with um, everybody who enters my lab that ultimately they are responsible for making their project work. And I'll do my best to help them, advise them, discuss with them. But in the end, uh, it's their decision what they do. You have a lot of expertise in a lot of different areas. If you could wave a magic wand right now uh, and just poof, be an expert in something, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. I, you know, I'm not sure I even would. For me, the fun is learning something that I'm not an expert in. So if I could just wave that wand, then I would lose interest in it. So That's I, a really good answer. Right now, uh, I'm trying to learn developmental neuroscience, and it's super exciting yes. because I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, but it turns out it's really interesting and important. So when you figure it out, sum it up and just tell me, I don't need to learn it. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's what you what? think. That's what you think. And that's what I thought yeah. too. And the fact yeah. is, as you said, that anything you dive into, almost anything you dive into, uh, that smart people have studied is worth studying. Otherwise they wouldn't have studied it. What is something that you used to believe that you consider naive now? Oh, that's easy enough. I mean, what I did my PhD thesis on which was the idea that the key thing missing in artificial neural networks was single neuron complexity. I think single neuron complexity is really interesting and important to biology, but I don't think it's the fundamental thing that's missing. I think that what I'm studying now is the fundamental thing that's missing, namely circuits. Of course, I'll probably look back in five years and think that was naive, but right now I'm convinced that that's true. Tony, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know that you have uh, some fun to get to with your kids in the city, so I appreciate your time here and continue the good work, man. Thanks a lot. This was really fun. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. You can support the show through Patreon for a microscopic 2 or $4 per month. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help sustain and improve the show and prohibit any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thanks for your support. See you next time. I don't